All right, hello everyone. Um, it is 3.05, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Will, I'm a PhD student here at the University of Michigan, and today I'm going to be presenting on scattered based neutron detection. So um, before we begin, um, if you have a question during the presentation, uh, please enter it into the chat and I'll address all uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Um, so starting off, um, why detect fast neutrons? And 
To answer this question, we first have to um, talk about why detect neutrons in general. So one of the primary reasons for looking into neutron and neutron detections is neutrons do not make up a substantial portion of background radiation. They do exist in background radiation, but the majority of them actually come from cosmic ray showers. So if you see here on the right, you can have cosmic rays enter into the atmosphere and they create these entire cascades of particles and different particle types that interact um, with the atoms and molecules in our atmosphere. And you can see down some of these lines, they do create uh, neutrons. And these neutrons can then go and detect with detectors or interact with matter um, down on the surface of our planet. Um, and this is uh, a primary source of background radiation of neutrons um, for our detectors or just in general. Um, so one of the things is when detecting neutrons, since there's a relatively low background, if you detect um, any substantial quantity of neutrons above that reasonably low background, that tells you that you have some kind of source present. And it's a property of specifically special nuclear material that either passively in the case of plutonium or when it's actively interrogated in the case of uranium, that it emits uh, substantial quantities of neutrons. So detecting those neutrons can be indicative of the presence of special nuclear material. Now, uh, neutrons are born typically fast, um, and we mean in the general uh, mega electron volt range. Um, most of the detectors that uh, Chris uh, presented on yesterday uh, work on the property of thermalizing those neutrons. So taking those and making them moderate interact with um, some kind of low Z material like polyethylene, or they just interact naturally with the environment and then go and interact with a detector, in which case we acquire a signature that a neutron interaction occurred. Um, measuring fast neutrons directly can yield information about the source that is emitting them, uh, yielding potentially spectroscopic information, timing information, things of that nature since we don't have the neutron scattering in the environment or scattering in some kind of polyethylene um, and then interacting with our detector. So what are some typical fast neutron sources that we might see and might be encountered? So the first one is a spontaneous fission source uh, known as Californium-252. This is a very common source that you'll find in most uh, nuclear laboratories or measurement laboratories, um, largely because it has a very nice half-life um, and it's uh, very small. It has a very high activity for the amount that you get of it. Um, also notably that you probably won't find in your laboratories is plutonium-240. Um, this one is the uh, common spontaneous fission source that you'll see in plutonium um, and any type of significant quantity of it. Um, additional sources, you'll also see alpha N sources. These are where you have an alpha emitter where that alpha particle then goes um, and interacts with some kind of uh, receptor atom and then you get a neutron out of that reaction. Um, very typical sources, ambi, americium, beryllium or plutonium beryllium. Um, these give tend to give a uh, higher energy spectra. Uh, americium lithium um, is another one where this one tends to actually give a lower energy spectra um, with an average, I believe, around 500 keV neutron that's given off. Um, in the top right plot here, you can see I have a comparison between spectra between a Californium-252 source and an alpha N source such as a plutonium beryllium source. And you can see the Californium gives us our standard watt spectrum, what we expect from a fission source. However, the alpha N spectrum, uh, due to the alpha particles of different energies interacting with the beryllium, we get all this different uh, structure in the alpha N spectrum and gives us a different energy range. So if we look at the average energy range for the plutonium beryllium, it's about four and a half MeV, whereas the average emission for the watt spectrum from Californium is about two MeV. Now, I uh, also list here plutonium oxide, which is a very interesting case because generally you can have plutonium-240, spontaneous fission, and then you also get an alpha N contribution from the plutonium alpha decay that then interacts with the oxygen. And this gives a rather unique alpha N contribution. So you can imagine this uh, watt spectrum from the plutonium-240, and then we get this additional about two and a half MeV neutron on top of that distribution from the alpha N contribution contribution. 
just to give you an idea of the variance that occurs with alpha N sources uh, relative to the spontaneous fission sources. And then of course, there are two types of commonly used fusion sources, uh, DD and DT, where DD is deuterium in a deuterium that produces a helium atom and a neutron. The neutron has 2.45 MeV, um, and this gives out uh, basically monoenergetic neutrons. The same thing with deuterium and tritium, where you have a DT fusion reaction, where you get another helium atom out and another neutron, but in this case, the neutron has about 14.1 MeV of energy. So just to give you an idea of some background of some of the neutron sources we can detect and might be looking for. So uh, as a quick recap, uh, uh, neutron interactions with matter. So now that we have an idea of where those neutrons are coming from and the sources we're looking for, what are the different types of reactions? So as Chris listed out yesterday, uh, we can basically break these down into two larger categories with many subcategories um, into scattering and then absorption. The absorption we can break down into capture, fission, and transmutation, where capture is effectively an N gamma reaction where we have a neutron come in and we have a gamma ray come out. Uh, fission is the breaking apart of a large atom, in this case uh, uranium-235 plus a neutron yields um, two daughter particles, neutrons, and a bunch of gamma rays. And then we can have transmutation such as with boron-10. For scattering, there's uh, two typical uh, mechanisms, elastic and inelastic. Elastic is where kinetic energy and momentum are conserved. Inelastic is where kinetic energy is generally not conserved and is transferred to the nucleus. That then creates an excited state, um, which can have a whole range of effects of gamma emissions or other emissions. Um, versus elastic, we just get a recoiled nucleus that based off of its mass and the scattering angle with um, the neutron has some recoil energy. And we're going to primarily focus on elastic scattering um, for this uh, analysis and for looking at scatter-based uh, neutron detectors. So let's take a look at elastic scattering in this case. So let's assume we have some incident neutron that has mass m sub n and has some energy e sub n. And it's incident on some uh, nucleus with mass m there. Hold on one moment. Uh, some nucleus with mass m there. Uh, this neutron uh, goes and scatters at some angle phi and the nucleus recoils with some angle theta. Um, because we assume elastic scattering in this case, we can assume conservation of momentum or conservation of energy, which is the energy in must equal the energy out. So the energy of the incident neutron equals the energy of the recoiled nucleus and the energy of the scattered uh, at uh, neutron, sorry, and then conservation of momentum, where the momentum of the incident neutron is equal to the momentum of the two particles out. Um, and if, and one other assumption we can do is take a ratio between the mass of our nucleus and the mass of neutron and call that A. If you uh, substitute in for the vectors for the velocity here, such that you can uh, put these equations in terms of theta and phi, you can uh, simplify these, combine these two equations, and eventually you can solve for the uh, recoil energy of the atom um, and relate it to the scattering, to its scattering angle and to the um, energy of the incident neutron. And uh, to anyone who hasn't performed this um, derivation before, I strongly recommend it. It is fantastic to go through for neutron elastic scattering and be able to see how this works out. So we now have this equation where we can see the relation with um, the recoiled atoms energy uh, based off of the scattering angle and the incident neutron energy. So what can we do with this? So the first thing to note is that uh, the energy of the recoiled nucleus is dependent on the mass of the nucleus and the scattering angle. And for this, we have to think about the scattering angle a little bit differently. Uh, so the uh, general um, 
metaphor that's used in this case because we're primarily going to be looking at neutrons interacting with hydrogen atoms or protons. And the mass of a neutron and proton are about equivalent. They're not, but for our assumptions, they're very, very close. Um, so if you can think of billiard balls where they have um, effectively the same mass and you have billiard balls interacting with each other. If you have the billiard ball hit another billiard ball directly head on, it's going to effectively transfer all of its energy to that other billiard ball and it's going to go in the same direction um, that the billiard ball was traveling. Um, in this case that would be a scattering angle of zero. Uh, however if the billiard ball um, that you're trying to hit the other one with just glances it you can have that uh, incident billiard ball go at a much uh, higher angle relative to the recoil um, billiard ball at that point. And neutrons and protons, or neutrons uh, for that instance, uh, scattering off of any other type of atom work in a similar matter. And this is um, opposite that of what we see at gamma rays, where gamma rays deposit the majority of their um, energy backscattering uh, in Compton scattering at 180 degrees. We see neutrons depositing the majority of their energy when they have a head-on collision when they scatter at zero degrees. So we can see here cosine of zero is one and we when we plug that in we see that the maximum energy um, or maximum recoil energy of any given atom is just proportional to its mass and the incident neutron energy. And here I have a list of, fraction, of fractional energy transfer uh, for neutron elastic scattering for several target nuclei. And you can see uh, this is very nice for hydrogen um, or protons in this case, where, pardon me, they have the same mass. So this simplifies that the mass of, or the energy of a neutron can scatter or can uh, transfer all of its energy to the uh, recoiled nucleus, in this case, the recoiled proton or hydrogen atom. And this is the uh, exact billiard ball um, representation where you have that direct head-on scattering. As we go to larger atoms, um, for what we're going to talk about today is this application in organic scintillators. Uh, so there's significant portions of carbon in those scintillators. We can see that for carbon atoms, we can only transfer about 28% of our energy um, to those carbon atoms. Um, so in this case, hydrogen is uh, much better in this retrospect because we actually get uh, more spectroscopic information since the uh, neutrons can actually transfer all of their energy to that recoiled um, proton. <laughs> um, so the question then becomes is, uh, how, what is the probability of these scattering interactions actually occurring? So uh, much like the Kalinashina cross-section for Compton scattering, there is a probability distribution for scattering angles, and it is not constant for neutron interactions depending on the material. Um, so for the first example that I'd like to show is for uh, helium-4, which we'll come back to at the end of this lecture. So this is a plot of the differential cross-section uh, for helium-4 with a constant neutron or with an incident neutron energy of 5.54 MeV. And we can see um, we have the direct head-on collision, so full energy transfer uh, or up to the endpoint for helium-4, of course, um, to just a glancing interaction. And we can see that it's higher probability for both the glancing interaction and for the head-on collision relative to this 30 degree scatter at this point. And this is um, much like what we see with the Kleinoshina. However, um, looking at hydrogen, uh, distributions or um, recoil protons, we actually see that this differential scattering probability is constant um, for uh, scattering off of hydrogen. So this makes hydrogen very ideal for detecting neutrons and for looking into recoiled neutron interactions because the neutrons can transfer all of their energy to the protons and because it's equal probability of scattering at every angle such that we get this flat probability distribution. So for instance, if we're looking, and we'll talk about this more in just a bit, if we're looking at a monoenergetic source such as a DD or DT reaction and have that monoenergetic neutron incident on our system, we will just see uh, a constant probability and then a cutoff for where um, the cutoff is equivalent to the uh, full energy recoil or full energy deposition of the neutron in our system. So I 
hinted at this, um, but we're going to take um, a little review back to um, scintillators and specifically organic scintillators um, for our neutron detection. So um, organic scintillators for these ionizing radiation interacting with the scintillator produces light. That light is then detected um, from a given photo detector and uh, these uh, and the production of light is dominated by the singlet and triplet state uh, production that are the excited states of the molecules that then de-excite and emit light. These, of course, are hydrocarbon based and we're, that's very significant um, because the uh, hydrogen content um, allows for the neutron elastic scattering off of hydrogen that we can detect um, quite nicely. And as just a general note, these are low atomic number and low density, so gamma rays will majority Compton scatter and there will be minimum photoelectric absorption. They're also uh, relatively insensitive to gamma rays relative, of course, to uh, semiconductor in, or inorganic scintillators that tend to be much denser and higher Z. Um, so uh, we talked about this last time as well, but I'd like to just reintroduce uh, pulse shape discrimination. Uh, so gamma rays interact through Compton scattering where we have a recoiled electron. That electron has a range on the order of millimeters in these different types of materials, such that the singlet and triplet states that it's producing are very well separated. There isn't a high density, so you don't get significant interaction of these different states. Uh, neutron interactions though, neutrons are much heavier than electrons. So when you, uh, or protons are much heavier than electrons, such that when you get a recoiled proton, it's going to deposit its energy in a much, much smaller range, such that you get a, uh, you get significant triplet state diffusion and then annihilation, where these triplet states um, will, uh, annihilation will produce singlet states, and those singlet states then decay and give this uh, later light, later time of light production. And we can see this directly. So here I have plotted a neutron and gamma ray pulse. This is from Stilbean, which is an organic scintillator. Um, coupled to a silicon photomultiplier. And we can see the neutron in blue and then the gamma ray in orange here. And just visually, we can see that the neutron has a much larger tail for the same pulse height than the gamma ray. And what we can do is take this and quantify it. So if we integrate, um, let's say, let's call this some kind of tail region, and then we have some kind of total region, we'll see that the integration for, uh, if we then take the ratio of the tail and total regions, we'll see that we'll get a higher ratio for our neutron pulse than for our gamma ray pulse. And if we measure this many, many times for many different interactions and generate a histogram of them, we'll uh, eventually see a distribution of these pulse shapes. So here um, I have a tail versus total uh, distribution uh, for a Californium 252 source. Um, and this is in a light output range of 50 to 100 KeVe. And I'll explain what KeVe means in just a minute. But for this, you can see we have this lower tail versus total ratio that corresponds to our gamma ray distribution, and then we have our higher um, uh, ratio that corresponds to our neutron distribution. So one of the things we like to do is quantify how good is our pulse shape discrimination capability. Um, and for that, we've developed um, what is called a figure of merit analysis, where we look at the difference between the means of these two distributions over uh, the summation of the full width that half maxes of these two distributions. And we can see um, these are both fit with Gaussian distributions, and they both uh, fit Gaussian distributions very nicely, such that we can uh, uh, accurately determine these parameters for uh, this analysis. Um, so let's say we have this defined tail region and this defined total region that gives us um, this pulse, uh, this uh, distribution and gives us some figure of merit. What we can then do is adjust these tail and total um, integration regions to determine the figure of merit as a function of these two defined regions. And based off of how we adjust them, we can actually find an optimized figure of merit. And since we assume the figure of merit is a judgment of how well separated these distributions are, um, we can then optimize our separation between the two distributions just by uh, altering these two integration regions.
Uh, and once we've done that, such that we have a figure of merit that is optimized and that we're happy with, uh, we can then quantify um, our uh, overlay between the two distributions. Here's up, oh, and there we go. And here's what I mean by that. So if we take this plot, um, which is just a histogram of the tail uh, or the uh, tail versus total ratio, and we plot that as a function of light output, and this is pseudo energy. And like I said, on the next slide, we'll talk more in detail about why this is pseudo energy for this analysis. We can see that we have our gamma ray distribution here. This is the lower tail versus total ratio. And then we have our neutron ratio here. Since um, if we take slices from, let's say, 50 to 100 keV in these ranges here, um, we can see that these distributions are approximately Gaussian in shape, um, such that we can set thresholds for our interactions or for our discriminations based off of the Gaussian distributions. And one of the reasons we would want to do that is that gives us a quantification of our misclassification rate um, for these uh, for a given discrimination line. So for instance, um, if we're looking for neutrons and we don't necessarily care about uh, gamma ray misclassification, um, but we do want to get rid of some of it, we can set a relatively low um, threshold. That would be this black line here at one standard deviation, where we effectively will have all of our neutrons interact with our system, but we will have significant gamma misclassification since we'll account everything above this line as a gamma ray interaction, even though we can kind of see here that no, we're definitely getting some gamma rays in there. And then as we increase this threshold, eventually we hit a point where uh, our gamma misclassification is effectively minimal, and then we begin uh, removing some percentage of neutrons uh, from our analysis. Um, the reason that one might want to do this and do this analysis for these types of detectors um, can be for accurately knowing how many neutrons you're going to be measuring if you are doing some kind of efficiency measurement uh, or you want to understand your count rates uh, very precisely. But this is also very important for modeling and modeling the neutron response of detectors, knowing these different misclassification rates and knowing uh, what portion of gamma rays show up or what fraction of neutrons uh, you are removing. Now, as I have said, um, this is in terms of light output, and all of these are in terms of light outputs, units of KEVE, um, as opposed to units of KEV. And here's the reason we do this. So generally for these detectors, we calibrate them using uh, gamma ray sources. Um, so you can see here in the top right, this is a cesium-137 distribution uh, used for light output calibration. Um, in this case, uh, cesium-137 emits a 662 keV gamma ray, monoenergetic gamma ray. There's only one of them. Um, since organic scintillators, and this is a uh, still being scintillator, uh, Compton scattering is the dominant interaction. We're going to only see a Compton continuum, and we won't see a photo peak for full energy deposition. So we actually have to calibrate off of the Compton edge and Compton continuum uh, to calibrate these detectors. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is we will simulate the our detector response and broaden it until um, it matches our uh, measured response. And from that analysis, we can actually figure out the calibration point where it is some fraction of this edge uh, relates to the true Compton edge of the gamma ray. In this case, this uh, point here is equivalent to 478 keV, which is the backscatter energy for that of cesium-137. You notice that this is in terms of pulse integral. We then take uh, the ratio of that point um, with the backscatter energy to be able to convert all of our pulses from uh, units of volt nanoseconds to units of KEVE in this case. And for gamma rays, uh, the unit of KEVE is the same as the unit of KEV. Um, the light output for a gamma ray interaction is um, equivalent um, in our system uh, in terms of the same units. The reason we differentiate KEV and KEVE is because these detectors are um, sent 
sensitive to neutrons. And neutrons do not, uh, do not have a light output response that is linear due to the quenching and annihilation effects. Um, so for instance, if we plot the relative light output versus energy deposition for an electron or for a recoiled electron in this case, um, we'll see that for any given energy deposition, we will get an equivalent light output. However, uh, for recoiled protons, if we have, let's say, one, ME or one MeV of light output, that's almost about a three MeV energy deposition. So the reason we have this light output term is because the uh, energy deposition or the light output for neutrons is not the same for that of gamma rays, even though we're seeing both gamma rays and neutrons in our same distributions. Um, so this is something we calibrate for and take into account. Um, but now that we've done this and we see how this is done, we can see start to look at some kinds of detector responses. Um, so for instance, um, what would be the neutron detector response for a Californium-252 source? As I mentioned, this is a very common spontaneous fission source that is used in laboratories. So what would be our response? So Californium-252 um, gives off a watt spectrum with a most probable um, neutron energy of about one MeV, and then an average neutron energy energy of just about 2 MeV. And we can see uh, here we have a measured and simulated neutron response using a cylindrical uh, liquid scintillator, where we almost get what looks like this uh, kind of exponential decay out. And this is um, the pulse height that we're showing, and then count rate on the side. And the reason we get this is um, because largely because of the shape of this watt spectrum, and then also how these uh, neutrons interact with our system, such that if you think of each one of these bins of neutrons will deposit um, uh, energy in some rate up to the endpoint of those neutrons, such that at lower energies, we have a combination of all of these lower neutron energies that can only deposit up into these regions, but if we also have the higher energy neutrons, these can deposit up to their at light output endpoint as well, such that we get this very high um, count rate low region due to a combination of those high energy neutrons that it's equal probability that they scatter at uh, higher angles in this case, only give deposit some of their energy, and for those lower energy neutrons, which are can only deposit energy in that region. And this gives us that exponential shape. Now, of course, this is just a basic measurement looking for um, neutron interactions with our system. Um, what are some more interesting measurements we can do with these detectors since we have something that is sensitive to fast neutrons? Give me one moment, please. So the first measurement I'd like to talk about is um, a time of flight measurement. So time of flight measurements are used to determine the kinetic energy of a particle by measuring the time it took to travel over some distance between two detectors. Um, for uh, measurements regarding uh, nuclear engineering, we use these a lot to produce quasi-monoenergetic sources of neutrons. And these quasi-monoenergetic uh, neutrons can be used to calibrate a detector, or we can use them to better understand the emission spectrum of a given source. So how does this work? So let's say we have one detector here and one detector here, and we've put our Californium-252 source right on top of this first detector, right on its face. Um, Californium-252 will spontaneously fission, and when it does, it'll give off some number of neutrons and some number of gamma rays. Um, we can then look for, because these detectors can separate out gamma ray and neutron events, we can look for a gamma ray event in the first detector and then a subsequent neutron event in this detector. Uh, the reason for that is we know gamma rays move at a constant velocity. They move at the speed of light um, versus neutrons were emitted in that watt spectrum such that we have an entire distribution of energies and speeds that those neutrons move at um, such that uh, by this method, we can see we have some defined start time, which is just the travel time of uh, this gamma ray into roughly halfway into this detector. We can then look at the travel time of these neutrons over this flight path, 
something to note um, is that we make the assumption that uh, neutrons with less than 10 MeV um, do not move relativistically or are not moving relativistically. And most for most of our sources, that's a great assumption since the majority of our neutrons are moving less than 10 MeV. Of course, this doesn't necessarily hold up for um, neutrons from DT fusion. But we can actually take this and break this down and look a little bit more at our response. So uh, looking at the pulse shape discrimination uh, ratio plots for these two detectors, if one is gated on gamma rays, which is our first detector, and then the other one is gated on neutrons, what is our time difference or time of flight uh, going to look like across these detectors? Uh, and we can see that distribution over here. So the first thing um, I'd like to note is that we have an initial peak just past zero. Um, so to note, uh, we can, even though we're gating for a gamma ray interaction and then a neutron interaction, we still have some small misclassification um, for our gamma ray interactions in this detector, such that uh, those gamma rays will travel at, again, constant velocity, and we will get a small distribution peak um, that corresponds to the flight time of those gamma rays to our detector we then see that we begin to get our neutron distributions, where the neutrons in this region correspond to uh, faster neutrons. These are our higher energy neutrons. And this is much lower um, just because our detector is less sensitive to them. The cross-section does decrease some. And then also uh, much fewer of them are emitted from our source, in this case, California. We then have a peak, which this peak probably corresponds to um, either probably about 2 MeV, but it could also correspond to roughly 1 MeV or in that range where it's most probable and average energies. And then we get um, our slower neutrons that, that um, are in this region, where these are probably below that 2 to 1 MeV. And eventually, we get to the point that our detector isn't sensitive enough to um, the lower energy uh, neutrons, uh, just because we might have some uh, light output threshold applied to our detector. Uh, something else to note for these measurements is that we have a continuum. Um, across the detector or across the response. And this is um, a combination of chance scattering with background and room return and then with the source itself, where these are uncorrelated events where we can have a uh, gamma ray or neutron go scatter off in the room, come back and happen to interact with our detector when we have a um, interaction in our first detector. And these are just chance coincident events that we have to take into account. And there are measurements that we might discuss later that we can perform to mitigate this effect um, or to quantify it at least. Um, so this is time of flight measurements, and we can clearly see that this gives us a good idea of the neutron emissions. Um, another measurement I'd like to talk about are cross-correlation measurements. Now, there isn't a significant difference between really a time of flight measurement and a cross-correlation measurement. It's dependent really on what is being looked at and then the placement of the source. You can use the same detector setup to uh, measure either. Um, generally, for cross-correlation measurements, the source is placed in between the two, tech, two detectors, and then we're looking at the relative correlations um, uh, between the combinations of particles emitted. So for instance, if we have a californium source, we can have a gamma-gamma interaction, so a gamma ray interaction in the first detector, gamma ray interaction in the second detector, and then a neutron interaction in the first detector, neutron interaction in the second detector, and then some combination of neutron and gamma in each independent detector. And if we look at all of those different uh, combinations, we can generate the following time difference plot here on the right. Um, so let's start off with photon, photon, or gamma, gamma, which is these uh, red triangles that you see here. And we can see the, this is centered right about zero, and it just has some small width associated with it. Um, this width is pseudo related to um, the time resolution of the system. Theoretically, uh, 
the gamma rays, if this flight path is large enough and the detectors are small enough, we shouldn't have any significant travel difference uh, between the gamma rays on where they can interact with the detector or that travel distance would be negligible. Um, but uh, in this case, these detectors are real, so they have some time resolution, which is a combination of the detector response uh, convoluted with uh, the electronics or convolved with the electronics uh, that gives some jitter in the timing of uh, when we know an interaction occurred, which is why we see this little distribution. If we look at the neutron-neutron distribution in the black diamonds here, we can see that this is also centered around zero, but is much broader than the gamma-gamma distribution. And the reason for that broadening, but still centered around zero, is because the probability of a given neutron energy um, emitted in either direction is constant, such that it's equal um, that you get some energy neutron in one way and so the same energy neutron in another way. However, in fission, um, it's very unlikely that you're going to get neutrons of the exact same energy. So what happens is that we could get a 2 MeV neutron to this, or a 2 MeV neutron to this detector and a 1 MeV neutron to this detector, which a 2 MeV neutron is going to get there first, 1 MeV neutron is going to get there uh, second, and that gives us some time, distribute, time difference. We can also then just have the same effect flip which is why we see that this has some centered around zero and then uh, some broadening because those neutrons do have some variance in when they arrive to the detectors based off of their kinetic energy. We can then look at the uh, neutron gamma and gamma neutron distributions. Um, and these are very similar to the time of flight distributions that we saw. So interesting to note for the blue distribution and the green distribution here, we do have a peak centered around zero, zero. And this is again due to that uh, gamma ray misclassification rate that we talked about earlier, where this is going to look just like the red peak and be centered around just like there, just with much lower intensity due to gamma ray misclassification um, in the opposite detector. We can then see that the uh, difference between the gamma rays and neutrons that uh, we begin to see these are the high energy neutrons that are closer to zero and then we get into our peaks which is the um, average or most probable um, energy emission and then we get into the um, higher energy or the uh, slower neutrons and the side regions for these detectors, such that this measurement also gives us some information about uh, the energy distributions of what's being emitted. It also gives us some direct correlation. So for instance, if we had an alpha N source here, uh, we could still see uh, the gamma neutron and neutron gamma interactions. We still might see some kind of gamma gamma interaction, but we wouldn't really significantly see a neutron neutron interaction. That would just be chance coincidence because with um, an alpha N source such as plutonium beryllium, uh, for any plutonium decay that then uh, meets a beryllium atom and yields a neutron, that's just one neutron per reaction. So there aren't correlated neutrons for that sources. Um, so this also gives us a method of gaining some information about uh, correlations given off by the source. Um, so these were the two types of measurements I wanted to talk about. Um, and uh, so finally, there's one last thing I want to touch on. And because we mentioned it before is helium-4. So uh, to give you an idea, um, organic scintillators are not the only types of scintillators that can be used for scatter-based neutron detection. Um, there's also significant interest in helium-4 detectors. Um, unlike uh, helium-3 detectors, helium-4 is very abundant and doesn't have the same uh, neutron uh, reactions that uh, helium-3 does. Helium for uh, just significantly has uh, scattering reactions that occur in it. And because uh, helium-4 is relatively low mass, we can still get significant neutron energy transfer to the helium-4 atoms. In addition, helium-4 is also very low Z, such that it's not very sensitive to photons. Uh, in addition, we fa have found out that it's pulse-shaped discrimination capable, um, in that if we have a photon interaction that Compton scatters, and we have a fast neutron interaction that scatters off of helium, we can see that we get a pulse shape difference between the neutron event and the gamma ray event. 
where we have a significant contribution of delayed light and then not as much contribution of delayed light uh, for these two detectors. So this is um, something relatively new and something we're uh, looking into and especially at the University of Michigan. Um, so with that, um, I would like to thank you all very much for your time and I'll be happy to take any and all questions. All right, uh, starting off with Jake, thank you for presenting today. We interrogate you with neutrons. How do we know the U won't go critical? Um, that's a great question. Uh, give me one moment, please. So multiplication is a material and geometric property. Um, so if you have a non-critical geometry, no external, no external sources can make it um, uh, go critical. Um, oh, and I see that Chris answered that right below it. Excellent. Um, how do you know the particles you directed are correlated? How do you know the particles you directed are correlated or detected? Ah, um, so we don't know. Technically, for any given um, particle, we don't um, necessarily know that it is correlated with another interaction. But what we can do um, with these uh, types of distributions is we look at um, many, many, many of these particle interactions and different particle types. And because, and if we get a general trend from these particle types, we can then assume it's correlated. So for instance, um, with these, um, uh, so with this detector for the californium, for instance, um, because we can see a neutron-neutron distribution, we know that we're getting um, a correlated neutron um, for this response versus if we have just an alpha N source or some kind of source that's only giving off a single neutron, we uh, will only see a chance coincidence for that. So in this case, um, we know that those are correlated. Um, afternoon, Chris. I'm confused by the case of reactor. We learned Californium-252 emits neutrons to kickstart a reactor. Is that a geometry thing? So I think um, there, I believe you can look into prompt criticality. Um, Michael would be uh, the one to potentially address this, but I think that's something you can look into for there. Because I know it's uh, relatively common that uh, there's an americium beryllium or californium-252 source that is in a reactor for those types of things. Um, but it has been a while since I've done the reactor criticality um, work. Um, what are the units on slide 16? Ah, these are in terms of nanoseconds. Um, Professor Goldston, um, very nice lecture. Slides had pretty small fonts. How many keV do we get from a 2 MeV proton? Ah, so uh, something to note um, for this. I believe this data is specifically for a um, I believe five inch EJ309 liquid detector, where we can see that for a two MeV uh, proton of dent position, we get probably just under 500 keV of light output. It's relatively low for this. Um, but however, um, this is both material and geometry and detector dependent. So we can definitely have cases where this light output curve will change and actually needs to be calibrated for any given type of detector. Um, some, uh, an additional question, Californium-252 just gets the exponential going once the reactor is critical. It is like seeding a lot of people with COVID into a city. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Goldston. Um, all right. Um, I hope that uh, address the questions. If there are any more questions, I'll be happy to stick around for a couple more minutes. But if not, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attending the lecture. <laughs>